Um, how are you guys doing? Good. Okay. A couple people. Good. Um, all right, thanks for joining us. Uh, so our speaker today is um, John Matsui, who is the co-founder and director of the Biology Scholars Program here at UC Berkeley. Um, he is a Bay Area native, um, and he attended community college before his four-year degree, ultimately completing a master's degree in biology from UC Berkeley and a PhD from UC Santa Barbara. Um, he taught biology at the community college level, which inspired him to um, look at addressing the needs of underserved students. Um, here at UC Berkeley, he's a lecturer in the Department of Integrative Biology and the Assistant Dean of Biology. His work with the Biology Scholars Program aligns with his desire to make biology accessible to all students, leveling the playing field for those who don't fit the historical profile of success. Um, he's really active in the STEM education, in STEM education um, on a national level. He's on the advisory boards for the NSF, the NIH, and the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. Um, recognized for this work, uh, President Obama awarded him the NSF Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, and Engineering Mentoring in 2015. Um, and I just want to mention an event um, that John is heavily involved in. Um, I went uh, last year for the first time, and I'm planning to attend uh, this year. I recommend that you guys check it out. Um, it, this year, this will be the third annual uh, Expanding Undergraduate Success in STEM Conference here at UC Berkeley, and that will happen um, in, um, on December 5th of this year. Um, and that's, uh, this conference is to really explore how the Biology Scholars Program model might be scaled or replicated to help address chronic underrepresentation in um, our STEM majors. Um, so please uh, welcome John alongside me. Thank you so much. Oh, so long day, long day, <laughs> but a good day. So uh, let me say thank you for being here. And let me tell you a little bit more about myself, in addition to what Lale has already said. Uh, I'm first to college in my family. I come from a low-income background. And I think I have a learning disability. All of these situations, conditions, characteristics made school a real challenge for me. And my title kind of indicates how I see myself. I've always been the outsider at the table. I've never felt as if I fit, I belong. Uh, with all the talk nowadays about imposter syndrome and so on, right here, right here. I always question myself. And as a, as a participant, I'm also an observer, an observer of myself in context. And I think that's been very powerful uh, to help me kind of figure out what to do with students like myself here at Berkeley in majors that are typically very unforgiving. And I'll talk a little bit about the context here at Berkeley for STEM majors. Really quite the challenge. And I went to Berkeley as an undergraduate after transferring from community college, which was a very nurturing place for me. And I had a real big wake up call when I came to Berkeley. Um, graduate degree from Berkeley as well as UC Santa Barbara. And I think that a lot of what we have presently really doesn't reveal what our past has been like. And I think that's one of the things that students don't always realize, is that our paths may have been as difficult and challenging as their current path is. And I think that sort of uh, authenticity and disclosure is really, really critical in terms of gaining the trust and being able to work with students from uh, backgrounds that really don't fit the profile of success here at Berkeley. And so let me tell you how we'll proceed today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the goal of BSP and how I define diversity. Also, the context, as I said, of undergraduate STEM education here at Berkeley. Also, what does BSP do? What is, what's the treatment? What are the components of BSP? Also, how do we select our students and what are the outcomes for our students in the program? And also, what are some future directions and some larger considerations around diversifying STEM and maybe other fields as well? So, what is this program? <coughs> the program began in 1992. I co-founded the program with a colleague, Professor Caroline Kane. Uh, who's Professor Emerita from Molecular and Cell Biology here. 
And she and I started the program. And at the very same year, there was a special issue of science talking about diversity in STEM. Now, I took real issue with the, with the depiction of diversity, the pipeline, and so on, and what diversity was within this pipeline. But I think the position of the then editor of science was that racism and discrimination were things of the past. Now, in 1992, the coast is clear. For anybody with the ability, with the drive, with the aptitude to succeed in STEM. So it was a clear, it was a clear playing field and a level playing field. And uh, clearly, that is not the case. And clearly, uh, a lot of work still needs to be done. The goal of BSP, and this is really, really important, is to enlarge and diversify the pool of individuals that succeed in biology majors and careers. And I'll talk a little bit about selection. We want to actually enlarge the pool and diversify the pool. Not just look for this narrow band of talent that some programs do. It's a different philosophical position that I've taken than some other programs. In terms of diversity, Here's the way I define it, define it. Individuals from backgrounds that least fit the profile of historically successful students in biology at Berkeley. So this isn't bound by ethnicity or gender, socioeconomics. It's a really broad definition of diversity. I'm looking for outsiders, individuals who don't feel like they fit in the university, nor have people like them from backgrounds like them have been successful here at the university in these STEM majors, outsiders. And there's a theme that runs throughout my work, and this theme is professional is personal. A lot of this stuff is very, very personal to me. And I wasn't trained in this work. Uh, I'm a behavioral ecologist, uh, evolutionary biologist, and I didn't really have the training to do this, but I had a gut level feeling and I didn't know the literature when I started the program. And after some time, I began to find words to describe what it was that I was doing. Now, that may seem like, you know, haphazard and so on, but this is the way the program evolved. So what's the context of STEM majors here at Cal? Uh, majoring in STEM at UC Berkeley, according to my students, here's what they have said. Challenging, of course. Exciting, yeah, science is exciting. Really interesting, worthwhile, intense, time consuming, competitive, and so much more. These are the words of my students. Now, why would they say such things? Exactly where does this come from? So let me give you some quotes of colleagues here at Berkeley, both faculty and staff, around various aspects of STEM, undergraduate STEM education. So the laboratory is a very important aspect of STEM education. You learn a lot. You get to apply what you learn in your courses. One of my students was going to begin research, and the PI of the lab said the following to him on the first day. This is science, leave your culture at the door. So science is culture free. But in fact, to this individual, when he came back and reported this to me, this individual really identified strongly with his cultural background. But you're supposed to leave that at the door. Welcome to science. In terms of advising, this student had gotten a C in general chemistry and a C in first semester organic chemistry. <coughs> and the advisor told her this. You may like science, but science does not like you. No, no questions about what happened. No backstory. How many jobs were you working? Did financial aid come in time for you to get your textbook so that you could begin to use that text to do the problem sets, etc. Teaching. Okay. Um, talking to a colleague about diversity and teaching and whether or not he adapted 
was, was cognizant of the fact that the demographics were changing here at Berkeley and that maybe there was something to think about here. And he said the following, I teach science, I don't teach students. And in terms of testing, testing, I was in this uh, workshop for STEM faculty uh, talking about uh, good test making. You know, what are we really trying to get at? And when somebody says, uh, one of the facilitators said, how do you know if you put together a good test? The colleague to my left, Sheila, excuse me, from engineering said the following. How do I know if I've made if, if I've made a good test? Simple. I get a curve. I get a curve that helps discriminate among the students in the course. And so, no wonder my students are feeling maybe a little uncomfortable, if not distressed, in this culture of STEM undergraduate education. And one more. Actually, a couple more. Competition. The competition set up by Curve Grading, one of my colleagues, in fact, then Dean, this was several years ago, not the current Dean, but then Dean said the following. Competition is a fact of life. The cream will rise to the top. Not everyone is meant to be a scientist. So it's good for us. It's, it's a good thing. And the solution? Talking to my colleagues again, one person said, it's an easy solution. If they admit the right students, there'd be no problem. You know, back in the day when the students were really ready and capable, we had no problems. We had no problems. Now, a Berkeley publication kind of summarized all of this on the front cover back in 2014. This intellectual Darwinism, Berkeley style. <clears throat> a very interesting depiction, and maybe what my students were saying reflected what they were experiencing in their STEM courses. But this isn't a rigorous study. Has anybody taken a look at this? Elaine Seymour and Nancy Hewitt, back in 1997, maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, monograph talking about leaving, why undergraduates leave the sciences. They took a look at undergraduates in STEM majors and asked the question, why do certain individuals leave, why do others stay? And they compared what students said to what faculty were saying, STEM faculty were saying. And here are some of their key findings and their conclusion. Students leave STEM because of the curve grading, emphasis on grades versus learning, and the cutthroat feeling in their introductory STEM courses. Students see it as intentional weeding out. Faculty see it as normal wastage. The less fit lead. And Hewitt and Seymour see it as over pruning of students with good potential. As they put it, ripping out half the garden or more of students with good potential to succeed and contribute to STEM fields. So what does DSP do? What does DSP do? The features that are typical of DSP and other STEM diversity programs in the country, uh, the list is there. And I'm sure those of you who have done work in this area, you can add to this list. But this is the basic list of things. But in terms of specific components that help to foster and promote the success of students in BSP, the list is the following. And again, I'm not going to go through all of this. The list is probably familiar to you. And in fact, all of us across the country pretty much say that we're doing the same things. We're doing the same things. But I would say that there is a difference in the philosophy of health. And I think this is really, really critical. And again, this comes from a personal place. In terms of the mentors that I respected most because they respected me, I kind of look back now and see that this was the case. That they took a strength-based approach versus a deficit-based approach with me. They looked for my strengths. And they acknowledged those strengths that I brought to STEM. 
And they tried to build on those strengths, and of course they identified where I needed to do work. But they didn't emphasize those. They didn't feel sorry or reach down to me. They said, you bring a lot, and we, you're only as strong as your weakest link, and they worked with me on my writing, my computational skills, my public speaking skills, and so on. And so this difference is really, really critical. We take a strength-based approach with BSP students. And that affects how we select our students. We don't look for students who need us. We look for students who can contribute to the program. And in this case, we coach our students versus trying to fix them or save them. And again, with, it's with respect. We assess where students are, where they want to be, and we devise an individualized plan with each of our students, kind of like a personal trainer, or the good coach that you had, whether it be in the performing arts, sports, whatever you have done that required coaching. Again, we're not playing the game for them, or playing the piece for them, or whatever. We're not doing that, but we're actually building on their strengths and helping them address and address their weaknesses. We have a shared responsibility in the program. We don't take the students' tests or write their papers. Of course not. But what we do is we meet them halfway. We expect them to step up and to represent themselves, to do their homework before the meeting with us. And there's sort of an iterative cycle here. And we give the students a choice. It's really important. Some programs in this country, some very famous programs, tell the student, if you don't do as I say, because I'm, I know what I'm doing, based upon 25 years of experience, you're not in the program. You need to follow what I say. Rather than that, I present information, and my staff presents information and opportunities for students to make their own choice. Anything that's so lethal, okay? Anything that isn't going to really knock them out of the university. Because through failure and through re-strategizing, they learn how to do open-ended problem solving. Which I think is critical if we want to develop leaders instead of followers. And so again, this philosophy of health, I think, has been really essential for the success, which I will show you, of students in the program. And finally, normal. Everybody wants to be a normal Berkeley student, right? We all want to be normal. We want to be accepted. But normal can be the end of the road for some of these students who try and be like their peers. The secret to success, I tell my students, is to resist the pressure to conform, but rather to assess their situation, figure out with the advisors and me, the individualized program they need to be successful. And so they may be on a different clock, which may not be the four-year clock or the two-year clock, depending on whether they're a freshman or a transfer student. They may take longer. But the focus is on quality and not speed. And I know that comes up against many uh, institutional policy uh, challenges and so on. I can't tell you how many times we've negotiated this with different colleges. And I know some colleges are more strict than others, and I understand that. But what do we want eventually? We want individuals who, when they graduate, have a GPA and skills and knowledge so they can actually move on to the next step. It's not just about the degree, but it's about what they can do with that degree. So how do we select students? What do we mean by qualified? That's a really loaded term. We're looking for qualified students. We're looking for outstanding students, but how do we define that? Our selection criteria are a little different than one might expect in a scholar's program. We look for distance travel, the starting point of students, what their high school experience was like. Was there a family history of higher education? What barriers got in the way? What challenges they had? And look at the distance that they had to travel to be here, to be a UC Berkeley 
student. That's a very important part of our selection. Passion for science, of course, it's the biology scholars program. Demonstrated commitment to service. Not just tell me, but show me. We look for things that they have done, and some of those things may be, may have been in high school, going back and taking care of younger brothers and sisters, taking care of a sick uh, relative. That's commitment to service. It may not count in terms of service in the formal sense, but that is service in my mind. Because guess what? With over 400 students in the program and only five staff, we need students to serve one another. Students are the most critical resource to each other in the program and to us as staff. There is no SAT or high school GPA threshold. We don't say you have to be this tall in order to enter. You have to do this well. We talk about what conditions contributed to their score or to their GPA. That's what we talk about. Were they able to take a Kaplan test to prepare for the SAT? No, you couldn't because you didn't have the time or the money. That's important information. That's part of the distance travel. And the potential to succeed is emphasized versus success to date. We realize that there are many life history conditions, circumstances, etc., that contribute to our ability to really express our potential. Instead, we use a list of alternative predictors of success. We try to look for resilience, persistence, authenticity, willingness to give and seek help, as well as the ability to regroup in the face of failure. Now, these are kind of soft features or characteristics, and we can only get that through interviews. And so it's a labor-intensive process. We want to make sure that students really, um, that BSB is a good fit for them. And again, I'm looking for the outsiders, not by choice, but by circumstance. Here's the demographics of BSP. Uh, 2002, uh, to, 2002 to 2008, entering freshman cohorts intended to major in biology. These are the groups that are represented up here. BSP participants in dark blue, all intended biology majors entering as freshmen in light blue. And you can see BSP overselects for women, underrepresented minorities, first to college students. You can see the profile. It doesn't look like the typical profile of individuals who succeed in STEM at Berkeley. The, the AP API score, 1 to 10, 10 being the highest around high schools, the academic performance index. 52% of our students come from the bottom half of AP, uh, based on API scores, the bottom half of the high schools in the state. Uh, they come in with lower high school GPAs and also lower math SAT scores. This does not look like the profile of individuals who are going to succeed in STEM. But lo and behold, just like the Oakland A's, you know the Billy Bean story? Moneyball, right? No, you don't know the story. So Billy Bean kind of set a new standard of what to look for in undervalued baseball talent looking for using metrics, in fact, saber metrics, that approach to look for indicators of potential. <clears throat> indicators of potential, not just how many home runs or what RBIs or you know, how many times on base, but other measures. So he selected Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, in an unfair game because the New York Yankees had these really deep pockets and the Oakland A's had some very shallow pockets to higher talent. And so what Billy Bean did was he turned selection, Major League Baseball selection, on its head by looking for undervalued talent using alternative metrics. And he got more wins per dollar than the New York Yankees and other teams. And now it's a thing. 
Okay? Now other teams are using the Billy Bean method. And so I would say that we're like the Oakland A's. We're looking for undervalued talent, looking at other measures of potential to succeed in STEM. And so what are some of the outcomes? Let's take a look at this. Again, for these 2002, 2008 entering freshmen who are intended biology majors, if you go along the x-axis here, they come in with the intention to major in biology, they then declare biology, they then graduate with a degree in biology with a high GPA defined as 3.0 or higher. And there are three groups that are being compared here. This gray line is all Berkeley freshmen intending to major in biology. The dark blue, again, is BSP, underrepresented minorities in BSP, and the light blue, underrepresented minorities not in BSP. And you can see the downward trend, the downward slope. And if you take a look at the gap in terms of graduating with a biology degree, everybody starts off, 100% start off intended, as you can see the decline. There's a 31 point or 31 percentage point gap in terms of graduating with a biology degree between underrepresented ethnic minorities outside of BSP and all intended biology majors here. But if you take a look at the gap with BSP students, it's only a two percentage point difference. Take a look at the final GPA. You can see that we're coming close to closing that GPA gap. We haven't done it yet, and we're working on it. And so students who don't fit the profile of success can succeed given the right support, given the right notion of help, given each other. And so what are the takeaway lessons? Diversity really is a barometer of institutional access. How well set up is the institution to support all students who are interested in majoring in STEM or whatever other major? And this comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was a brilliant piece of legislation. Not saying, okay, this building has to be accessible to people in wheelchairs, let's see what else, on crutches, let's see what else, to people who are visual. No, institutions need to be, buildings need to be accessible to all. So how can we do that? That is how I view diversity as a barometer or indicator of accessibility. If we lack diversity, we need to do something about the institution. Not fix the student, but fix the institution. Selection, we need to rethink qualifying. My students knock it out of the park, right? And they have, they have starting points that would, most would say, well, they don't belong in Berkeley in the first place, let alone in STEM. But you can see what they've accomplished. Treatment. Underexpression of potential runs rampant in STEM. And we see that through the study of Hewitt and Seymour and others. There's potential there that's underexpressed because of the treatment, I would argue. And the value of diversity. Uh, Hannah Valentine and Francis Collins at the NIH argue that we need to do more research on what diversity brings to STEM. This isn't just about doing the right thing, you know, social justice, great, but what value does diversity bring to STEM at the bench, in the field, in terms of policy making, those sorts of considerations. So looking forward, just take a few, a, a few, make a few more points here. Why does BSP work? I don't know. I mean, I've described, but I haven't rigorously researched this. BSP has been a black box, and I've flown by the seat of my pants for the last 25 years. So I thought, you know, why not bring in a social psychologist to help me really kind of understand why BSP works? Nika Estrada, who's uh, on faculty at UCSF. She's a social psychologist. And what she's doing, she's doing a longitudinal study on the impact of BSP on student self-efficacy, science identity, uh, incorporating the values of science into their lives, and the reduction of stereotype threat. She's looking over time how 
interaction with BSP helps to mitigate some of the challenges that students are facing in the classroom, in the laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. The working hypothesis is that BSP reduces institutional ambiguity. Students are getting mis mi mixed messages. Diversity and excellence, right? They're all about diversity and excellence, yet a lot of the microaggressions that happen, or maybe not so microaggressions when you heard some of those statements that are made. Yeah, students are confused. And living in a state of ambiguity, you know, that's a tough place to be. So maybe BSP helps to mitigate that. Can we scale and replicate BSP? How generalizable is the model? What are the barriers and limitations? What are the resources necessary and the feasibility of doing this maybe in the other STEM disciplines? And are there other models that are more relevant, that are better, more useful, <coughs> more realistic in the other STEM disciplines? And here I'm not talking about creating more programs. I'm talking about the transferability of our practices into regular, normal advising sessions, into classrooms, into laboratories, not to have an island of responsibility that we call a program be responsible for doing it, but a more distributed model trying to build institutional capacity to support all students in the ADA type fashion. And so, I have this HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute funded project, and Lale referred to this, expanding undergraduate success in STEM. I have a five year grant from HHMI, in fact, tomorrow night I'm flying back to HHMI because we're gonna be renewing this grant, and we have to have a conversation about the renewal. And one of the things we had, as Lolly said, was we had this annual conference, please come. It's going to be on December 5th during Dead Week. <coughs> so hopefully you'll be available to come to really take a look at how reasonable is it to try and adapt BSP more broadly to the UC Berkeley campus rather than just simply doing it within BSP. But also, Dr. Estrada, Mika Estrada and I are talking about creating a STEM diversity institute where social science research will happen on what works for whom under what conditions when we talk about diversifying STEM. And here's the big question. How should we invest in diversity? Well, first of all, we need to re redefine qualified and talented. I mean, clearly we have data that indicates that students that don't really fit the profile, those undervalued students can be successful. Here at UC Berkeley, in majors that are typically over the top competitive, etc. So we need to rethink our metrics, how we define qualified and talented. And what about the strategy? Do we work with only a few students? I have 400 students in my program. Or do we work with many students? In other words, do we mine for those gems, or do we develop and grow our talent here at the university? Do we exclude by investing heavily in a few, or do we democratize, and this is an equity issue, democratize STEM undergraduate education account by making all of our classrooms, laboratories, etc., accessible and supportive to all students not just to those who fit the historical profile of success. <clears throat> and also, what are the, the desired outcomes? Now, some people are bean counters. They want diversity. Well, here we're talking numbers, right? They want to have more black and brown faces, more women. Diversity is a number, but inclusion, true inclusion, is a feeling feeling welcome, feeling supported, feeling as if you belong. And so when we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, we really need to think carefully about how we do this diversity work. And so I'm going to end it here and open up the floor to questions.
Please. What is the admission rate um, of the BSP program? So basically, how many students do you turn away? So one in four applicants is admitted into the program. And again, we don't use SATs or high school GPAs. We look for that fit between uh, what students will bring and what they get. And so we're looking for this commitment to service and community. And you know, our students call BSP a family, a community, uh, a place where they can take off their armor. You know, it's all those sorts of things. So we're looking for individuals who, who, who will fit that profile. So you mentioned a lot of these, like that fit, um, these are soft metrics and you do a lot of interviews. How many of your students do you call in for an interview that apply? Um, let's see, once they reach the interview stage, you know, so we call in a few more than 100, we admit 100 every year. So carrying capacity, 400 students. 100 graduate, 100 new students come in. That's, that's the flow. Yeah, because we do a paper screen. Actually, you know, we, we have them select, um, submit electronically their application. And then we, from those, we, we select those who are to be interviewed. Please. How do you ensure that you're reaching out to everyone that meets the program? Because I imagine there's case students that maybe would be great fits for your program that maybe aren't as aware of it as it would be ideal. Yeah. Uh, we try to tap into the student network. Okay. We also tap into EOP. Um, in the past, we had um, the Coalition for Excellence in Diversity and Math, Science, and Engineering, which has kind of gone into a period of quiescence because uh, some of the programs no longer exist. <coughs> and yeah, there have been some challenges so that we could, we could reach out to engineering, um, <coughs> chemistry, mathematics and, and and so on and so that's tough though but for some students right out of high school joining BSP may not be the best thing and I'll tell you why high school is their frame of reference and they want to join everything okay because that's what got them here they joined everything and BSP in their minds is a club not a program but a club so they join the club they don't know what they're signing up for. They heard it's good. And they haven't really experienced Berkeley yet, so they don't know the value of BSP. And so sometimes a student who's out there a semester, or even a year, they really see the value of BSP. And once they apply and they join, they're solid with the program. Please, Lolly. Um, I wanted to know what the role of like faculty allies Yes. Is in relation to the work that you guys do? Yes. What shape or form does that take? Yeah. Um, many of the faculty are very interested in the program. Um, the small cohort that is consistently at the table, these are individuals who are personally committed. They, they're, they're at everything. They're at all the national conferences like SOCNIS and Abercams, you know, these diversity conferences. Anytime we need a faculty panel that are signing up, uh, they're always asking if, if there are students for their laboratories because we pre-vet the students and we also make, uh, you know, uh, prepare them so that they're research ready, they can contribute to and benefit from the research experience. So in all those ways. So we need to expand the circle of faculty, but the word of mouth uh, among students gets the word out to the, um, to the students and word of mouth through faculty gets the word out to faculty. And so, um, yeah, not everybody knows though. They've heard about BSP, many of the faculty, but they don't really know, they haven't seen this. Okay. And this is my, my responsibility. And there's something called bandwidth that <laughs> I run out of, you know, with all the things. Yeah, please, Sean. Two questions. The first, just could you say, tell us a little bit more about the kind of programming once you're in, that yes. constitutes the commitment you know, yes. from the students. So that, and then second, it's just it's very provocative to you know when you raise the issue of like um, building structures like this that aren't programs, but rather normalized yes. campus practices, and, and reflect a little mm -hmm. bit on your experience of like pushing that vision on campus and where you know. 
This is being videoed. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we could talk about that another time. But, uh, or, or at least your vision yeah, sure. for how that would unfold. Sure. In a perfect world. Yeah. So, so the first, first question, logistics. Okay. So just adding on the yes. first question, you were saying, and I really like that, that, that your students are your most valuable resource. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it expressed in the program, and how, how much are you designing these interactions, yes. or just letting it emerge? Yes. Naturally? So part of it has to do with whom we select, you know, the qualities we're looking for. That's a really, really critical piece. And we have one of our students here today. Hello, nice. Two, two, two over there. Oh, uh, cool. I'm sorry, I just look <laughs> So we have three VSPers here. Yeah. Um, maybe you guys could talk about what it is that VSP does that is so valuable, rather than me describing what you folks go through. I, I personally see the most valuable aspect of VSP being the fact that it eliminates the competition that we have within our peers. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, competition that we always have to be one-upping the next person next to us, especially in the STEM field. But removing that, it feels like we're almost con we can contribute with these people, we could grow with these people. And I think that this is what's really helping the students in the ESP. Mm -hmm. Anything more to add? Well, we're freshmen, so we haven't applied yet, but we're in the seminar, and a lot of what um, Dr. Martin talks about is like what he talked about the presentation. Did I lie? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so just like how, um, like, this is such a big university, sometimes we need like that community, especially like as minorities, to like study this together and feel like we can do it. Anything else? Same thing, like, as you said, um, I'm also a freshman. Um, coming into, like, you know, to this big university, it's just like, you don't know as a first generation student. So you just like, you know, um, going to the seminar and you just like realize that you've never heard before. And it's just like, I don't you know, it's just like, wow. So, yeah, it's pretty like, it sounds so fun. Thank you. So, all three students are in my freshman <coughs> transfer seminar. The seminar is called Studying the Biological Sciences. It's an introduction to the culture of the university and university science. And so you're learning a bunch of stuff. What research is, all those sorts of things about procrastination, time management, like we talked, and the per perfectionist trap that we talked about today, and, and, and so on. We also have study groups. We also have advisors and advising. We have peer advisors as, as well. Uh, and a really key component of BSP is the BSP room, right? It's the BSP room. It's a student center, it's not a lounge, okay? It's a student center where students come and only BSP students and their friends can use that as a place to study, hang out, heat up something in the microwave, take a nap, sometimes stay overnight if they have to, those sorts of things. And one of my colleagues once said, without geography, there's no community. There's got to be that place. That place is very, very important. And it's not often a bungalow someplace where you have to walk a couple of blocks. It's in Valley Life Sciences Building. And that's an institutional statement about the importance of the program. That's skin in the game for the institution because space, you know, the final frontier. <laughs> you can always get more money, but it's really hard to get more space. Okay? So the second part of your question is, what are, the, what are some of the challenges around uh, expanding, uh, uh, replicating, uh, scaling the program at institutions. Institutions, uh, Berkeley is a place like many other universities where there are neighborhoods, disciplinary neighborhoods. And because uh, you know all faculty are entrepreneurs, they want to develop their own. And it's really hard, it's really a challenge to get over that uh, steep gradient to actually begin to address that. And this um, conference that we have each year is an attempt to get people from multiple disciplines together to consider the possibility of, uh, of adopting and adapting the best practices of the BSP in their, in their disciplines. And there have been a couple of disciplines that have actually um, developed BSP type programs in computer science, in engineering, uh, and, and so on. And um, 
um, uh, Shayla Kapadia in Equity and Inclusion has done an inventory of the hundred and some odd uh, different programs on, on campus. And I think that baseline is really important to have, to know what exists before we start adding new things, to look for gaps and so on. And so there are a lot of challenges. Uh, and uh, I understand, people, people want to do their own thing. I mean, that's the culture of ac academia. We want our own. And uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yes? Yeah, so I'm curious if you have heard from your students or you know, you've been made aware of any uh, stigma, stigmatization yes. associated with the program? Okay. okay. Yeah, it's a minority program. This is minority education. You know, it's like uh, backdoor stuff. Uh, I haven't heard it. Uh, in fact, I think that the image of BSP is that our students are sitting in the front row. They're wearing proudly their t-shirts and their, their sweaters. Uh, they're setting the curve. They're going, let me just share a statistic. And this is what kind of uh, dispels some of that um, uh, you know, not equal to, lesser than. Uh, many of my students are interested in medical school. And the take rate in the nation for applicants to actually being admitted is 50%. UC Berkeley has a 55% take rate. VSP students who apply to medical school get in at the rate of 85%. Okay? Now, does that mean that right out of, you know, four years, the straight into medical school? No, they have one, two, three years gap years. They do something else. But they are competitively eligible and medical school ready, as well as graduate school ready. I have more and more students now going to graduate school. But medicine is really the sort of the big dog, right? That, that's, that's what students want to do because it's science and service combined. And so I am not aware of a stigma attached to being part of this program. Although People who don't know might say, well, that's minority education. In fact, I had one faculty member say, no, it was not last conference, but a couple of conferences ago, yeah, this minority education stuff is fine, but I want to learn lessons transferable to all students. Okay, well, what we're learning here is transferable to all students. But it's that false dichotomy between minority education and what's right for regular Berkeley students. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, you know. Okay. Please. So, um, one of the slides earlier mentioned your philosophy of health and everything that you suggested there in terms of making it student-centered, you know, the strengths-based focus, yes. coaching, shared responsibility, are things that the advising profession yes. aspires to or should aspire to. Yes. Um, and so I was wondering, <coughs> How, how you can leverage um, this model of VSP that actually should be a model everywhere for all sorts of advising. Thank you. Um, given that we have people with different experiences, different faculty or grad students may have been trained differently yes. to be very you know, Darwinistic. <laughs> yes, sure. So how, how might we expand the culture of, you know, that strength-based advising, coaching-based focus? So, in the research lab, faculty, that's the coin of the round. Research productivity, yes? How can this approach help increase their research productivity? If we send VSP students to laboratories, research-ready, competitively eligible to actually be at the bench, such that the productivity of the lab goes up, there it is. So it's a what's in it for me consideration. <coughs> All of us won't change unless there's something in it for us, professionally and personally. And so we need to really think, and that's why the research is important. That's why, the, you know, Francis Collins and Hannah Valentine, Hannah is the uh, Chief Diversity Officer at <coughs> NIH. And Francis and, and, and uh, Hannah say we need more research to take a look at the relationship between diversity and good science. And as soon as we begin to demonstrate that, that productivity can go up, new ideas can be generated, better questions can be asked, different ways to interpret data that leads to you know, more discovery, 
then we've got a winner. That's why we have, that's why we're proposing a STEM diversity institute, to actually begin to, in a systematic, structured way, go about trying to take a look at those questions and other questions. Okay? So we need evidence. But evidence is necessary, but it's not sufficient because of the politics, because of the culture, all those things. But the what's in it for me piece, I think, is really, really important. Other questions? It's called wait time, right? <laughs> yes, please. Um, so I'm kind of curious a little bit about your interview process, because I've been starting to hear little bits and I don't have a lot of firm evidence, but that some people are concerned about bias during interviews. And I'm wondering if you guys have strategies okay. to avoid maybe like situations where a student may not interview well, or they might be kind of shy, or yes. you know, they might be neurodiverse. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear how you guys approach that. So we're using the multiple uh, uh, interview process. Okay. Uh, that's being used in medical schools, MMIs. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about that? Multiple, multiple medical, mixed interviews. What, what's multiple mixed interviews. Multiple mixed interviews, MMIs, where we have a station, five minutes at a station with one interviewer, with one question, next station, new interviewer, new question. And maybe have five to seven stations so that students can actually if you're not comfortable with one individual, mm -hmm. you get you have a diversity of interviewers. Okay. And we're trying the MMI approach mm -hmm. for the first time this coming spring. Oh, okay. And so we're kind of ramping up, we're doing a beta test, mm -hmm. we're asking students for questions that they think are relevant to get at, you know, the fit between student and program. Yeah. And we're asking them to participate, to do sort of a mock MMI. Okay. okay. And so what that does is with the you know, it kind of it may balance out. I don't know what research has been done on MMIs and, and bias. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. OK. That seems, that seems to be the rage in medical schools. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Question. So how did, how did VSD decide to like, sort of mine for gems in the sense that you do have an admissions process versus like, the development of students and like, supporting everyone who might be the So. Uh, we are mining for a different type of gym. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of it is practicality, it's carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure quality versus quantity mm -hmm. because I, I didn't want to dilute or overwhelm the resources. Mm -hmm. Study groups, uh, use of the room, advisors. So I wanted to focus on, on, on quality. And by that I mean quality of service, not quality of individuals. Individuals who don't make it into BSP, I don't say they're not quality. It wasn't, it, they weren't a good fit for, for the program for, for whatever reason. So it's not disparaging. Um, that was the practical reason. Also, some of the individuals that weren't uh, selected for the program may have actually influenced some of the culture of the program in a way that would be more like the larger university where there's competition. You know, one of the things that comes out of some, um, some uh, applications is, you know, I heard you have study groups, I heard you have paid research opportunities, I heard, I heard, I want, I need, versus coming at it, you know, I would like to be part of this community. I'm giving you a big hint here. <laughs> That's a big difference. That's a different framing. And so I think that because we are strength-based, but it's also what do you bring? What do you see in yourself? Take the self-inventory, and what do you bring to help contribute to the larger BSP community? Now, to ask a 17 or 18-year-old that, that's a tough one. But students have stepped up, knowing that, yes, this is an important aspect. It's not just about them getting. It's not just transactional. It's relational. And I think that's really, really important. But some people want this more transactional approach, right? They go, they get what they need, and they leave. And that's fine. They're not bad people. They're just not a good fit for BSP. Please, Paul. Um, since you started the program, was, was it 1992? 1992. Um, have there been 
has there been feedback from alumni that have gone through your program that have, has um, like changed the way that you guys offer resources or like changed the way that you thought about the needs of the students going into your program? Or? Sure. So uh, first of all, one of the things that I've learned to do over the 25 years I've been doing this program is I've learned to listen. Listening is a very important skill that most of us are not rewarded for. I mean, if you think about you know, the competition in academia, uh, you're rewarded for speaking and not really for listening. And so I've learned to listen. I give lots of opportunities. This course that, that three of my students are in is a, is, a, is a chance for people in the course to hear, but also to give me feedback. I watch what's going on on faces, body language. I'm going to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the 80 students in, in my course. Yeah, I, I, promised, I promised all of you that. That's going to happen. So that I can actually listen to see the impact of what I'm doing in that class. We also have a student advisory meeting that happens maybe every two weeks or three weeks where we run ideas by the students, like the multiple uh, mixed interview idea. We ran that by the advisory committee. Anybody who could come, and we listen to their concerns. We ask them what sorts of questions should we ask. Is this a good idea? And then I had, I had three alums come by today. And one, one just got a faculty position at UCSF in the School of Medicine. And she came back to kind of talk about that and you know, how BSP impact, not just to think, but also to identify particular things. One student's in doing a PhD in the School of Public Health. And so we were talking about her experience in BSP and how it prepared her for you know, doing the PhD. And the other student is just finished her MD. She was at UCLA, and she's doing a residency in the Valley of Community Medicine. And she and I talked also. And so um, feedback and listening are really, really critical. And I would say, if you were to ask me, where did BSP come from? Not just from me, but it came from everything I've heard from my students over all these years. That's where it came from. And then I found in the literature, yeah, hey, I'm doing the right thing, you know? I know what to call it now. And that, and that was really an interesting sort of revelation, discovery on my part, that I was doing a lot of the things the literature says are good things to do. Yeah. Other questions? Any comments, reservations? Anything that doesn't seem quite right? Please. How much of a focus was the question? How much of a focus is there in the program on like institutional change in, of the faculty and how faculty approach this versus like students using different resources? Yeah. I think I think through sending research ready student researchers, undergraduate researchers to labs, that has helped to educate my colleagues. That's one thing. This conference. This annual conference is another place where faculty see data, you know, around, uh, there's, a, there's a survey called UQs, it's the Undergraduate uh, um, Experience Exit Survey, where uh, one, of the, one of the questions, one of the prompts was around campus climate and where the climate was receptive versus where it was hostile. Biological sciences did not do well. And that was a wake-up call for many of my colleagues in biology. Mm-hmm. I heard a buzz, and that buzz was brought back to department meetings and so on. And for those of you that need to leave, please, please feel free, free to go. I understand. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that with time, not so much with training, and in fact, I think that the frame here is advancing practice. And Sean, we talked about that around mentoring. It's around advancing practice. How can we advance our practice? in the laboratory, classroom, versus I'm going to train you. And see, again, this is strength-based. We're going to advance your practice versus I'm going to fix you because you're in deficit. So what goes for students also goes for faculty in terms of our approach. Nobody wants to be fixed. But if we acknowledge strength and build on that strength, that's the way to go. And again, I'm really thinking about how to work to build this into the reward structure more for faculty. The research piece is, is, is clear. But other ways, other ways. 
And in fact, um, I'm going to be at HHMI, I mentioned, uh, uh, later this week, and I'm going with the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, our new Vice Chancellor, Oscar de Bohm, and we'll have plenty of time to talk. And so, this is going to be, this is going to be, you know, trapped in the plane, <laughs> trapped in <laughs> HHMI, <laughs> and we'll have plenty of time to talk. <laughs> any other, any other comments or questions? Okay, folks, thank you very much. Thank you.